when we did the, the problem before of we had you know, the, the two objects colliding, whether the three things in common, and we talked about the whole energy gets kicked off by Newton's third law, and they have the same displacement. So we talked about force times displacement. The other thing that was going to be in common for the two things was time. They touch each other for the same amount of time. And so let's take a look at that. I'm going to start with Newton's third law. So the force on A from B equals the negative of the force on B from A. Now, if I haven't said it before, uh, or uh, potentially I'm saying it again, I'm going through this derivation not so that you can regurgitate it. I'm going through this derivation so that you see where this stuff comes from. I, I want to give a sense of this all flows together. This is not suddenly, hey, let's come up with something brand new and try and look at it differently. So it does come from the stuff that we've already studied. What is Newton's second law? Is it the action reaction uh, law? That's the third one. The equal but opposite reaction? That's the third one. Oh. We've actually dealt with the Newton's second law of motion quite a lot. The acceleration of an object is directly related to the net force. Inversely related to its mass? Yeah, A equals F over M, or F equals MA. It's the equation of motion, it's the template for the equation of motion. So this is the force on A. Let me write that in, down again. This is the force on A from B. Since this is the force on A, then that's equal to the mass of A times the acceleration of A. And that's going to be equal to the negative mass of B times the acceleration of B. All right, so that's just Newton's second. That's Newton's third law with a second law additive. Now we'll multiply by the time they're touching each other. So we have mass of A times the acceleration of A times the time of that they touch each other, T or delta T, whichever one you prefer, equals negative mass of B times the acceleration of B times the time that they're touching. It's the same time, so they don't need subscripts. And so it now comes down to what is acceleration times time? Well, let's go to the definition then. What is acceleration? we go. Change in velocity over time. Therefore, what is acceleration times time? Uh, just change in velocity. Absolutely. So we have mass of A times the change in velocity of A is, and I, we are keeping the vector symbols here. If I accidentally leave one off, I'll probably go back and change it at some point, correct it is mass of B times the change in velocity of B. Change, always final minus initial. So this is mass of A times V A final minus V A initial is negative mass of B times V B final minus V B initial. So I've got a binomial multiplied times something on the outside, so I'm going to distribute. And this is the longest line of, that we'll be writing in this derivation. So this is mass of A times VA final minus mass of A times VA initial equals negative mass of B times VB final plus 
mass of B times V, V initial. Because we're distributing over here the negative mass of V. At this point, physicists, physicists get tired of writing. So they look deep into their soul and they say, well, mass times velocity shows up four times here, so let's come up with something for that. And so, hey, why not? Let's use the letter P. Because, yeah, why not? I think Rene Descartes is the one responsible for that one. So this becomes this quantity P final minus this quantity P of A initial is equal to the negative this quantity P B final plus P B initial. That was our scattering move right there. All right, so now the thing that gets physicists' hearts all a Twitter. Notice if I get, if I add this P, B, B, F, uh, try that one again, P subscript B, F to both sides, and then I add P, A initial to both sides, So I'm getting all the F stuff on one side and the I stuff on the other. So those would cancel out, those would cancel out. What I'm left with is this P A final plus P B final equals P B initial plus P A initial. They're all still vectors. So in my collision with two objects here, I'm just like, like that's supposed to be a capital P as opposed to all the other P's which are lowercase. This capital P subscript I for the initial is equal to this capital P subscript I. In other words, whatever this is, my total before the collision is the same as my total after the collision. And that's a conservation law. And that's what makes physicists' hearts go all a flutter. Any conservation law in physics is a very powerful tool. Questions up to here before we actually start doing vocabulary? So, this right here, of course, has a name. It's called momentum. The total initial momentum equals the total final momentum. Point uh, uh, one little caveat and then talk about why we can ignore it. This equation right here assumes acceleration is constant. However, if we do not assume acceleration is constant and actually use calculus, we get to the exact same place. So this is true whether acceleration is constant or not. And acceleration is not going to be constant in a collision because you have two objects that are moving along. Even if they move it along at a constant velocity, so their acceleration is zero, then they hit, then it becomes something maximum, and then as they separate, potentially, uh, it's back to zero again. So there's a fluctuation from some experiments that we are not doing this semester, but the plunger carts, if you put a plunger cart up against a force sensor and you look at the force, basically the force looks like that on the plunger cart. So that would be force first time for the plunger cart. 
And since acceleration is directly related to the force, the acceleration first time will look very much like that. One of the powers of conservation of energy, the stuff that we just finished, was that we don't care about direction. One of the detractions of energy is the fact that we lose information about direction. Momentum, on the other hand, is the flip. The advantage is the fact that we keep track of directions because it's a vector. The disadvantage is we have to keep track of direction because it's a vector. So it would be nice to figure out, all right, so when do I want to use energy and when do I want to use momentum? Well, let's talk a little bit about that. Oh, what other bit of vocabulary? This right here is the, was the force on A from B times time. Now I'll put delta B into this one. Down here, uh, so I don't do any changing until this point right here. So this is just my final momentum minus my initial momentum or just change in momentum. And so force times time is equal to the change in momentum. So we can also write force, therefore, is equal to the change in momentum over the change in time. So Newton's second law is F equals MA. It turns out that this handles life a little bit better. This actually is the more generalized equation for Newton's second law. Because Newton's second law, for the most part, assumes the mass stays constant, but what if mass isn't constant? That equation kicks in. So this is a more generalized form of Newton's second law. And if you've had calculus, change the deltas into Ds, and you're basically dealing with the first derivative. If you haven't had calculus, then that was not a common thing. Or later on, when you take calculus, you go, oh, that's what he was talking about. Of course, over here, this change in momentum or force times time has a name. Because why not? Let's see if this works with this group. But I'm going to consider my most obscure reference ever. I've got some pretty obscure ones. It's named after the, it's named after uh, well, a product that came out in the 70s. When someone suddenly buys you flour, that is called nothing. <laughs> today it is. <laughs> so, today it is. If someone suddenly bought you flowers, that would yeah, yeah, whatever. That, I, I at least usually get it nice or something. In false. And you can find that commercial on YouTube. At least you could a couple years ago, but I assume nothing ever leaves. So impulse deals with the change of momentum or force times time, whatever information you have to be given, either one works. here, a five kilogram mass moving to the right at two meters per second. And it is heading for a four kilogram mass heading to the left at three meters per second. And they will collide. And stick together.
what is the final velocity? If we were using Newton's second law, the, the stuff that we have learned up through chapter six, we would need to know how does the acceleration change during the entire, from the moment they first touch to when they finally sort of settle in their final position. And we just don't have enough information. We can, we can model it as potentially a triangle, but the beauty of momentum is we don't care what happens in the interim. We care about beforehand, we care about afterwards. So, first off, we need to figure out what is the initial momentum. I know my overriding principle is that my initial momentum is equal to my final momentum. My initial momentum, I've got two objects here, so this would be with the lowercase p here. This is my initial momentum of, I'll just call it five sub i, plus the initial momentum of the four sub i is equal to the final momentum, which is, well, it's now a nine kilogram object, so it's nine sub f. So what is the momentum of this five kilogram object? Somebody go for it. Formula is written on the board. It's probably in most of your notes. Uh, what was the question again? What is the momentum, the initial momentum of the five kilogram object? Uh, two meters per second. That's initial velocity. Right. What is the formula for momentum? Okay, therefore, ten. So P initial of the five kilogram is ten. Ten what? Are you stopping there? And missing something? No, no. Yeah, this in the kilogram. We multiply five kilograms times two meters per second. So that's 10 kilogram meters per second. There's a dot between the kilogram and the meters to emphasize that multiply those units. And Brandon, you were the one who said 10? I was one of the people. Right? One of the people? Of all the people who said 10, what assumption did you make? going in that direction, positive direction. Okay. Combining that, you assume that that's positive direction. Correct. Yeah. We did not establish that beforehand, because I was curious to see if people would recognize the assumption that was made, but this assumes that to the right is positive. Therefore, what is the momentum of the four kilogram object initially? Kilograms per meter second. Ooh, close. I, I think you would have written it down correctly, but you set it a little bit off. You put per in the wrong spot. Kilograms per meter second. That, that's what you said the last time. Is it? Oh. <laughs> Say again? Yes, okay. you said per meter. So kilogram, oh, actually I should put the number down, negative 12 kilogram meter per second. So we now have the bits and pieces, therefore what is my total initial momentum? Negative two? K. 
kilogram meters per second. Absolutely. So we get negative two kilogram meters per second. So what is my total funnel momentum? Would be the same answer. Absolutely. That's what conservation means. <laughs> Now, my final momentum, I'm trying to figure out what the velocity is. I, that's what I'm trying to figure out. But I know the formula for momentum. And the formula, well, what is the formula for momentum? Uh, it's uh, P equals mv. Yep. So it's our mass final. They combine into one thing, so that's 9 kilograms times my final velocity. And so now it's a math problem. The math problem officially is negative 2 is equal to 9d. That's the math problem we're dealing with. What is the final velocity? Negative two over nine um, meters kilograms per per second or kilogram meters per second. Oh no, meters per second. Yeah, meters per second. The kilogram gets taken out by that one. So meters per second. Or for those fraction fans, negative point two two repeating meters per second. So they are going to collide and then move in the negative direction towards the door. And you got the nine from adding the five and four together, the masses? Yes. Okay. Uh, oh, wait. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So my total momentum stayed the same. Let's take a look at the impulse acting on each. Because if they're both going negative two ninths meters per second, that means each, each one is traveling negative two meters per second. So my, so P phi final would be the mass of the five kilogram mass times the velocity of the five kilogram mass final. So this is five times negative point two, uh, so it's a fraction, negative two ninths which is negative 10 ninths kilogram meters per second. That's the final momentum of just the five kilogram piece. The four kilogram piece of it is gonna be four times point, negative point, uh, we get fraction, negative two ninths. So this is negative eight, ninths kilogram meters per second. And if you add those two together, you end up with negative two, which is what we established already as the final momentum. So let's take a look at the impulse. The five kilogram mass starts out going 10 kilogram meters per second. It ends up going with, I worded that poorly, the five kilogram mass starts out with 10 kilogram meters per second of momentum. It ends up with negative 10 ninths. What is the change in momentum?
Let's see if we just did it on a calculator right here. I got negative point one, and it's a repeating number. You say it again. I got negative point one, one, and it's a repeating number. Uh, I think you missed the type something. Same thing. Well, I got negative 11.1. Negative 11.1? 1. 1. Repeating? Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Negative 11.1 repeating kilogram meters per second. Now, over here, we'll take a look at this change in momentum. I start out at negative 12 kilogram meters per second, and I go to negative 8 kilogram meters per second. What is my change in momentum? of the four kilogram mass. So one of them had negative 11.1 .1 units of impulse, the other one had the positive amount. Because whatever one loses, the other one gains. Again, that's this idea of conservation of momentum. One's going to lose, other one's going to gain. So this would be the impulse. preliminary talk, topics that I need to talk about. Any questions at this point before I get to these last two preliminary topics? Right. Units. All right, so obviously the units of momentum, the SI units, kilogram, meter per second. But if we look at the impulse equation here, the change in momentum, it should have the exact same units as force times time. So a kilogram meter per second is also a newton second. Some people prefer the kilogram meter per second, some people prefer the newton seconds. Personally, I don't like either of them because I don't want to write that much. So here's what you can do if you do not want to write out the units. And some people will stick to it because they refuse to do this up next thing, and that's fine. You can make up your own unit. Now the rule is, the rules are, one, do not use something already being used. If your name is Nick, don't use a capital N. You can do a fancy, some, you know, you can do a variation of that, but don't use a letter that's already being used because capital N's already been taken. I create a unit to honor some, one of the guys who was one of the first people to work with momentum, and that was Rene Descartes. So I create a unit called the Descartes. The three lines there means I'm defining it. It is going to be this is going to be true because by definition, that's what the three lines mean. Kilogram meter per second. This is valid as long as I write it down. This is not a standard unit. If you went to some, the only people who probably would have any clue about what they're talking about if you said, yeah, I have a five day carts of momentum would be students that I've had before. Anyone else will look at you blankly. So on a test or a quiz, if you're going to make up your own unit, you don't have to use Descartes, you can use something of your own, a letter, or I've had some students use symbols. 
you need to define it on the test or quiz. If you write it at the top of the very first page, I'm assuming it holds true for the entire test or quiz. If you want it just for a particular problem, then write it on that particular problem. So that's done computer science, that would make it a local variable. But at the very beginning of the test, that makes it a global variable or global definition. So the impulse here, negative 11.1 repeating Descartes. This is a true statement because I have it written up there. Now, if I go to erase the board, and the first thing I do is I erase this, that is now wrong. So if you're going to define it, make sure it's defined. And I'm going to put it back up because I still don't feel like writing it all. And magically, this is correct again. Does that make the other ones incorrect? No, those are still, you can still use the old stuff. That's <laughs> yeah. perfectly fine. But I got a little bit more flexibility and I don't have to write as much. All right, any questions about that unit? Or anything else on momentum at this point? All right, the other preliminary topic I have to talk about here is, I'll do markers. I have a marker here. From our point of view, what is its velocity? Zero. What is its momentum at the moment? I see people giving head gestures, but you know, you can say it out loud. Thank you. In well, we can do that now. Zero Descartes. All right, so the total momentum is zero. And then I let go. As, is it fall, as it's falling, is the momentum still zero? No. So I went into this deal about the fact that my initial momentum is equal to my final momentum, but as this fell, it goes from zero to 